Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Cheryl Lee, and I'm an exercise referral specialist and somatic movement educator. So for Menopause Day, I've been asked to talk to you about managing pain. So my job is actually working with people with pain conditions to get them moving uh, and to get them fit and also teaching people relaxation and stress management techniques. And not only do I do this professionally, but it actually, unfortunately, arose out of necessity. So I was a school teacher 12 years ago, and I thought that I would be doing that until retirement, but oh no, plot twist. And I entered the world of um, pain management after a traumatic birth that uh, left me with chronic pain. And it was devastating at the time. I was told that there was nothing could be done and um, I couldn't be helped anymore by physiotherapy. Just, just take the meds and start using a wheelchair. So it wasn't great to hear. Anyway, I, I, I'm still on my feet. I was going to say, as you can see, but I'm sat down. Anyway, I, I am still on my feet. Um, so anyway, after being told um, that nothing can be done, um, I discovered that, yes, actually, there are things that can be done and, and that I could actually do most of them myself. Um, so I can't share everything that I do here in this kind of 10 minute slot, um, but I am teaching a six week course on restorative movement and self care specifically for perimenopausal women and it starts on the 7th of November and it would be lovely if some of you um, would join. Uh, so the event link should, should be available under this video, so have a look. So anyway, restorative movement, I mentioned restorative movement. Why restorative movement? Well, when uh, I was seeing a pain management specialist way back when I was you know told to signed off with meds in a wheelchair um I just given these poxy leaflets about exercise and how I should be exercising I was just like I'm in too much pain to exercise I can't exercise it just felt like the wrong advice just felt like it wasn't applicable to me my body felt like a dead weight, just fatigued and tense. And when I tried to exercise, it just made, seemed to make everything worse and really achy. Um, and at, around that time, I'd been to a sacrocranial therapist. And after, after the session, and she was also actually, she did movement and she did, she did stuff with breath. And after that session, I, I felt like, wow, I feel really good at the end of this session. And it did, okay, it didn't last um, forever, but, um, you know, it was enough of a window to, to kind of, to give me hope that, do you know what, maybe I don't have to be in this awful pain for the rest of my life. Maybe there is something beyond, you know, just taking this medication and the idea of degenerating and, and you know, and, you um, losing the ability to walk so um right so so after that I thought let me let me have a look at you know there's maybe more to to breath and she'd mentioned about movement and we'd done a little bit of movement and she'd also um the thing that really got me thinking was she she was talking about the nervous system and saying that um you know, the, what, what we'd done in the session was alter my nervous system in some way. And, and that really intrigued me. So um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I did some study. I discovered somatic movement, um, trained, did more study on the nervous system. And I just became really, really fascinated with the nervous system um, and movement. Um, you know, going out down a different route, not the traditional kind of, you know, we think of bones and muscles when we exercise, but um, the nervous system was something that really uh, changed things for me. And some of the key information that was a real golden nugget was um, about movement maps in the brain. So let me tell you about those. 
can just find that information. Um, All right, so I've got some notes there, so I don't forget stuff. Um, because I've got brain fog because I'm very menopausal. So um, yeah, so we have these movement maps in the brain. So there, there's your brain there, and then we've got these little blue strips to the left and right, which are sensory maps, so sensing what we feel and the red strips to the left and right, which are the motor maps, which is how we move. And if we take a closer look, so kind of zoom in here to this bit. Um, so that's the center of your brain. And then, you know, where the tongue is, um, that's kind of where, you know, round about the ear. So you have the body mapped in these strips and you see that the strips are kind of um, next to each other. So you've got the sensory, and the movement connected in the brain. Now, just look at the, um, the way the body is represented there in the brain. Um, notice how some, some body parts are much bigger than others. So we've got the, uh, the face, uh, the tongue, and just think of all the things that we have to do um, you know, with, with the eyes, our senses, our uh, sense of smell, our hearing, our, um, our speech, taste, communication, all of those things that go on. Um, and so that, that those body parts are, have a, a, a lot of neurons. Uh, and this is what these maps show, incidentally, the amount of neurons um, dedicated to different body parts look as well at the hands and just think of how important the human hand is and all the things that our hands enable us to do so that is an area of high representation in the brain and also you know to get us from a to b we've got our feet uh, of course so the feet the hands and the face all massively represented in the brain just moving on to the next <laughs> picture. So the brain might look, might view the body a little bit like this model. So this is called the homunculus or homuncular man. And it's a representation of what the, um, the brain might view the body as in terms of the amount of neurons. Oh, and, yeah, and the other point that I didn't make was, uh, you know, if we just um, have a look at this, this part of the brain here and look for the back and just notice that actually how tiny the, the area is that is dedicated to the back. So it's hardly represented at all. Um, when we think of um, where, when we, where we tend to have pain, um, you know, commonly places like the shoulders, the spine, the neck, the hips, and we really don't have that much brain space devoted to those areas. Interesting, more on that later. So um, the important thing about these maps is that the brain is constantly updating its maps based on our activity. So what did I want to say? Yeah, based on our activity or indeed our inactivity. So the brain gets good at what we do and not good at what we don't do. We think about it like that. Um, and there have been some quite interesting experiments to, um, to show the effect of movement on the brain and lack of movement on the brain. So just moving on. So in one experiment, uh, a person's four fingers were taped together for a total of two hours. Um, and what happened was that the representation 
of the fingers in the brain began to, and this is a technical term, smudge, so it's called cortical smudging, they began to sort of smudge into one another. So the brain couldn't perceive a difference between the fingers anymore. When the tape was removed, the person couldn't sort of individually move the fingers for about 30 minutes. And then after about 30 minutes, normal um, movement was restored. And after five hours, so a similar experiment um, that lasted five hours led to the person not having full use of the hand for two hours afterwards. So the longer we are inactive, that the more effect it has on the brain. And there's an interesting image to, to kind of show that uh, this, so this is our homunculus, the representation of the brain. And that is an imagining of, you know, what it looks like to the brain when it can't really see a body part. So let's just extrapolate that experiment to, to our normal, to our real life. So, what if you sit in a car for an hour on your way to work and then you, you go to your desk and you're at your desk for sort of, you know, seven hours or so. And you promise yourself you'll, you'll you know, go, go for a walk at lunch. But instead, you end up doing your emails and a whole week has gone by or a month or several months and you still haven't started going for that walk. And then you come home in the car you eat, sit down to eat, and then you sit down and maybe watch some TV in a film. That is a lot of training for the brain in that seated position. And if you just think how, um, how much movement you would do of the neck, the shoulders and the hips with that kind of routine, um, you know, then it's easy to see how, all oh, right, so this, this smudging might be occurring on a um, you know, on that, on a level with me every day, um, according to, you know, what I'm doing in my life. And think of our feet as well, you know, our feet are, are, are in shoes, um, and how tight are your shoes, what are your shoes like, are they comfortable, and how long are your feet parked in these shoes, not individuating the toes. So, um, it's definitely, uh, you know, something that can contribute to pain is when we don't have a good map of the territory and it's something that people really don't know about people just assume or it is assumed in society that it, it has to be an issue in the tissues um, and then you know they go for an MRI looking for an issue they're told that they have um, arthritis or degenerative disc disease what they're not told is that everyone's scan who's over 35 would look pretty similar um, and, and, and they might not have pain. So somebody with a very similar scan might not have pain, but if you are told you've got a disease and your spine looks like this, then you're scared to move. And so that can contribute um, to the scenario being frightened to move. Or maybe you, did an in, you, you had an injury after you went to a class and, and it, it really hurt and it, you, you don't want to, start exercising again just like like me but the idea of exercising when when I was um, in a really that dreadful state after birth trauma there's, there's no way I could have exercised so um no God, I got off the point there a little bit <laughs> so uh, yeah so anyway so th th this idea of um sharpening the the maps in the brain is um, can, can really help us with um, decreasing pain levels in the body. Oh, and that's the other thing that I was going to say. So if um, we're experiencing a lot of stress, looking at the post in, <laughs> in, in, the, in the perimenopause um, support Facebook group, there's a lot in there about anxiety and about stress. So that is increased at this time because there's, there's more happening. And what do we know about the effect of stress and anxiety on the body? We don't breathe well, so we're not getting that movement uh, through breathing and um, our muscles get tense, which adds to this picture of um, you know, lack of movement. 
add to that, we're not sleeping very well. Um, and, you know, we've got sleep deprivation and our, our hormones are all over the place. And, you know, it builds up. So we can really harness the power of movement to, to turn down that volume um, on our pain. When we slow down our movement, so this is why restorative movement, okay? When we slow down our movement, the brain can see the territory again. The brain can remap the territory. And when we have a good map of the territory, then we have better movement. Somatic movement actually focuses on the center of the body. So those areas like the shoulders, the spine, the neck, the hips, that don't have great representation in the brain to begin with, um, you know, we focus on those and get movement in, in those areas. Moving slowly makes you breathe slowly, which calms down the nervous system, which uh, gets you in a parasympathetic state, exiting from that fight flight, and then our bodies can recover. It's called the rest and digest state, and we can reach that rest and digest state, the, the relaxation response, through slow breathing and mindful movement. And when our body is in that state, we can uh, literally, you know, our, our cells recover better and digestion improves. So we might have issues with IBS or constipation or, or that kind of thing. And our body can, um, it, it can help our body to regulate when we have um, a good restorative movement practice. And also, um, you know, if you've been scared off movement a little bit and you've been having these aches and pains and you haven't been moving as much as normal, just little things like walking up the stairs or um, somebody was saying the other day, brushing the hair, like lifting the arms up to brush the hair, just feels um, uncomfortable and it makes you not want to do it. It makes you not want to do exercise. But when you res do restorative movement, which actually focuses on areas that you, you don't uh, reach in a normal exercise class, then, um, and those, move those areas start to get better mapped, then movement does feel more easy um, and it does feel more comfortable to be in your body and then you can start doing different kind of exercise with more ease um, and e exercising the lungs and the heart doing strength training loading your bones and uh, you know bring, really bringing different kinds of movement medicine into your life so let me just come out of here. Um, oh yeah, all right. So this, uh, this is a little meme from um, a pain educator called Greg Lehman. And um, he, one of his phrases is calm, calm stuff down first and say stuff, <laughs> calm stuff down and then build stuff back up. So we all know about, um, you know, loading our bones and we know about doing strength training and we know about sort of, you know, trying to get fitter at this time of life, but it can feel really difficult to do it if your body is in a lot of pain to begin with. So restorative movement really helps to calm down the nervous system, regulate um, your body so that you, it, it's a lot more comfortable for you to start exercising. Okay. All right, so um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I was gonna do a little kind of um, quick movement session at the end, but I think you've, you've got enough to <laughs> listen to there. So I will do that separately. So it's a, a very quick kind of um, postural reset and bone loading uh, movement snack that'll just take about three minutes. Uh, so I will post that separately. So in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the talks on um, this um, Menopause Awareness Day. And please do get in touch if you're interested in restorative movement. Thank you.